Good morning. The Bible reading this morning comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, beginning at verse 1, and I'm reading from the NIV version. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. I'm not sure if I introduced myself when I was up here earlier for the baptism. My name's Lachlan, one of the ministers here. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this Revelation series. For some here, uh, they might share my sentiment that it has been an incredible journey. For others, they've been praying every step of the way, come now, Lord Jesus, already. And for others, oh, praise God, we've got a new series starting next week. But no matter what, here we are at the very end of Revelation. Let me pray for us as we begin. Father, in your goodness, you have given us your word, your word that explains to us who you are and what you've done for us. We pray, Lord, as we look into here, this last chapter of the last book of the, your last testament, we ask that you might help us to understand you, help us to understand our relationship with you now because of Jesus and help us to understand what is about to come. And for that, we look forward and we say, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Well, I'm sure that each of you has a particular moment or maybe moments that you remember where you've been just completely awestruck at something. You know those moments, whether it be a special occasion with your family, whether it be an early morning sunrise or an afternoon sunset, where it's just caused you to gasp and see the glory of God whether it be reconciled relationships, whether it's the kindness of humanity revealed in a particular act, those times when God's display has been evident, like he's lifted the veil of the kingdom to come just a little bit. The fog has cleared away and we see God in all of his glory. I'm sure each of you have experienced moments like that. Uh, Ian's just come back from America. Uh, I was in America December last year and uh, one of the things we wanted to do as we plotted our way in an RV from one side of America to the other is to see some of these incredible natural wonders that exist in the USA. One of the things that we're really eager to see is the majesty and the beauty of the Grand Canyon. We arrived in our RV uh, just after sunset and we came past this sign with anticipation of what tomorrow would behold for us as we stood on the rim. We knew that the Grand Canyon was known for its huge temperatures on the edge of the rim, I'm told. In summer it can reach up to 38 degrees and in the bottom of the valley even up to 47 degrees. But when we woke in the morning and pulled back the curtains and opened the door of our RV, this is what greeted us. Three inches of snow, a blizzard had come through in the night and it was completely whited out. We weren't to be deterred, we were going to go and see this wondrous glory that God was going to reveal to us. And as we headed out, we sent a scout on ahead of us, my son Tim, and this was the view that we saw from the rim of the crater. <laughs> Tim came back eagerly to us, huddled in the RV with the heater blaring. Come out family, come and get a photo of us in front of this wonderful sight that God has given for us. So we uh, snugged up, and here we are looking into the wonders of the Grand Canyon in the background. <laughs> uh, indeed, we, we were shown photos in explanatory things about what we should be seeing, but the fog had descended, and that wasn't for us to see. We did see some interesting things, though. For example, cactus growing in snow. Now, there's something that you don't see every day. We only had a day there and as we departed in amongst a, a road that was quickly filling with snow and in danger of being closed off, as we left the National Park, you still drive along some of the 
tributaries of the Grand Canyon, as it were. And as we did that, the fog lifted, and lo and behold, we got to see a glimpse of the wonder that is the Grand Canyon in this side tributary of the Grand Canyon National Park. Well, the veil for us was lifted just a little bit here as we saw this. And indeed, for us, every now and then, we get those glimpses of heaven in our world. In fact, in the Bible, it says that we are like under a veil. We are in a fog in this sin-bound world of ours. And only now and then do we see glimpses of the wonderful scenes that the Bible portrays in Revelation. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, we read this. For now, we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. I'm looking forward to that day. I'm looking forward to the moment when the whole Bible story finds its culmination and completeness, not only in Jesus, but in that consummation of the great wedding that we saw last week. God's people in God's place, under God's rule, for eternity. But as we step into the last chapter of the Bible and we start to read and the scene comes before our eyes and our imagination starts to wonder what this heavenly realm is going to be like, we find that it's fairly familiar in that we think that we might have seen this scene before. Now in the last chapter of the Bible we have a reflection, in fact a fulfillment of the very first chapters of the Bible. For here is the new Eden, the first creation made new in the final realm of the heavenlies. No longer a dim image as we might get in a mirror, but vivid HD reality. Like the veil has been completely removed, we now see with incredible clarity what God has only previously shown in glimpses through history. So as we step into Revelation chapter 22 here, and I hope you've got that open in front of you there, I just want to have a look at four things that Revelation 22 now reveals in this new high-definition high reality of the kingdom to come. To begin with, the water of life. This water of life is coming from the throne of God. Life flows from God and His Son. This is no trickling creek that dries up in the summer. This is a torrent of love and life that flows out from the temple that exists in here in Revelation 21 and 22. And it comes forth eternally. The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb down the middle of the great city. But of course, we've seen this river before. We've seen God's giving of His water of life in many different places in the Bible. But the reflection we get here of the second Eden is that of the first Eden in Genesis chapter 2. Now the Lord God, we've gone back to the beginning of the Bible now, from the last chapters back to the beginning chapters, the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden. And there He put the man He had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. Now most of us here in the developed world wouldn't really know what it's like to go without water. We haven't really experienced serious thirst. Here, maybe we don't get the sense of how important the water of life is. Just imagine not being able to turn your tap on and take a drink. Imagine not being able to buy a bottle of water and sip at your thirst, even as I see Alice right now sleeping of her thirst over in the corner here. Imagine not being able to do that and just feeling death creep upon you. Well, here was an everyday existence for those that lived in the ancient world. Water was so important and finding that source of water. So it's fair enough that God and then Jesus uses the analogy of water time and again to show how precious the life-giving reality of what God and Jesus has done for us. 
We see it in the Garden of Eden. But we also see it in the story of Noah. For some, the water brought judgment. But for Noah and his family, it brought salvation. We saw it when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt towards the Red Sea and the sea parted so that the Israelites could be saved through water and then the waters came over Pharaoh's army pronouncing judgment. As they're wandering in the desert for 40 years and they're thirsty, that's what happens in a desert, water was produced from none other than a rock that God had given them that water. Then in the New Testament, John's baptism declared that the washing of water was what was required for the forgiveness of sin to symbolize the outward display of an inward change, just as we experienced with Brianna this morning. Outward change of an inward reality. And then, of course, Jesus himself, with the woman at the well, said, I am this living water. Brother wants a little bit of a go of the attention as well, I think. Well done. In John chapter 4, Jesus said to the woman at the well, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them the spring of water welling up to eternal life. Here, water is found its fulfillment in the end at Revelation chapter 22. But that's not the only thing we see in Revelation. Of course, there are other images that take place. The second image is that of a tree, the tree of life. In verse 2 in Revelation, On each side of this river that flowed out from the temple stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Back in the beginning, you might remember from that verse that we just read from Genesis chapter 2, a little earlier on, that there existed trees in that garden. Two trees, in fact. The tree of life, which we now also see in Revelation 22, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which we don't see in Revelation chapter 22. God told Adam and Eve, do not eat from the trees in the middle of the garden. Which trees did they end up eating from? None other than the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You see, previously Adam and Eve had only known good. They'd only known God's goodness and graciousness and love to them. But here, by taking hold of this particular fruit, they knew evil. What had happened is that the whole created order had been turned on its head. By listening to the snake, the created order had been turned upside down. It was meant to be God's the ruler. Humanity rules under God over creation. God, humanity, creation. But here in this fall moment in Genesis chapter 3, the order is reversed. Instead, it's creation, the snake who takes the lead. Surely God did not say not to eat of this fruit. He knows that if you eat of it, you will know good and evil. You will be like him. The snake's the boss over humanity. And as a result, God comes in a distant third place. Creation order has been reversed. And here today, we feel that tension. We feel because of sin again that God is not in his rightful place. We're not putting him in his rightful place. He absolutely still does rule and reign, but instead we're saying, ah, no, God, we've got a better idea. We're not going to live our life with you as our king. We want to be our own king. And in that moment, God showed his mercy. Some might think it wasn't merciful at all, but God actually showed his mercy to his wayward creation. In Genesis chapter 3, the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Us being the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, humanity has now become like one of us. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life. Remember two trees, good and evil, that they ate from, tree of life, and eat and therefore live forever. For if humanity had been allowed to take from the tree of life, they indeed would live forever, 
but they would be living in sin forever. A broken relationship with God, a broken relationship with each other, a broken relationship with creation. God had another plan. The tree of life makes another appearance. Not just here in Revelation 22, but earlier on in the Bible as well. The Greek word uh, used for tree in tree of life in Revelation chapter 22 is xylos, which doesn't actually mean a living tree. It more means something like lumber or timber or a dried piece of wood. But how can a dried up piece of wood provide life? Well, this same word is used for the cross of Jesus by the apostles as they explain where Jesus died. So from 1 Peter, he, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the xylos, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. I don't think it's an accident here that John uses the word for a bit of timber or is shown this tree of life that is actually the same word for the cross of Christ. Everything is about Jesus. Everything in Revelation points towards Jesus and what he's done. The cross of Christ is that which brings healing to the world and exists here in Revelation 22. With its 12 kinds of fruit, each fruit uh, blossoming and growing throughout the 12 months of the year for the nourishment of the people. Here the cross of Christ nourishes the new creation. From this tree, all things are nourished and sustained and creation is healed for eternity. Which brings us to the third thing to notice about Revelation chapter 22. The curse that was proclaimed in the Garden of Eden is now removed. The result of sin entering into the Garden of Eden was a curse placed upon creation, humanity and the land. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see this curse proclaimed firstly upon the snake who was to forevermore eat the dust, crawl on his belly and be threatened by humanity with a long-handled shovel. Women, on the other hand, who uh, would, should have been looking forward to childbirth, childbirth became a painful experience. Of course, relationships were broken and there would be ongoing enmity between humanity. Of course, that enmity would continue into uh, humans' relationship with the land and the ground would no longer be fertile and would need to be worked hard by the, spread of, uh, the sweat of the brow to produce a crop. And ultimately, we find as part of that curse that humanity... Creation is removed from God's presence. But now in the new creation, there will no longer be any curse. The curse has been lifted. My Old Testament lecturer, uh, Trinity Theological College in Perth, used to explain that before Jesus, the problem was that because unholy creation existed in a world of sin and evil, it meant that holy God couldn't come in contact or even into the same world. How can holiness of God be in the same place as unholiness of his creation? For if those two things were to meet, the result, my Old Testament lecturer would say, is toast. Not toast of God, but toast of the creation. But here in the new creation, no longer any curse. The relationship between the creation and humanity is restored. The relationship between creation and God is restored. The relationship between humanity and God is restored. As a result, we can see God face to face. Which is our fourth point about Revelation chapter 22. We shall see God's face. Now, that might not mean much unless you know your Old Testament. For you see, when Moses was asked by God to lead the Israelites out of the slavery in, in Egypt into the promised land, Moses was a little bit cheeky. 
And he said to God, look, I'm not going to do this unless you show yourself, God. Don't hide. Show yourself to me. Who are you? What's your name? I need to know these things and then I'll stand up and lead your people. Now, if I was God, I might have just been, smite you, Moses. But rather he was gracious. And he said in Exodus 33, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I'll proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face, face must not be seen and indeed after this moment even as God passed by and uh, Moses was able to see his back he ended up with third degree burns on his face and he had to walk around with a veil as he pronounced what God had just done to the rest of the Israelites holy God meeting unholy man the result is toast but now in the new creation we have been made holy by Jesus his death has meant that we are redeemed, made holy again, and we can gaze upon the face of God. The throne of God and the Lamb of God will be in the city and His servants will serve Him. They will see His face and His name will be on their foreheads. Here, those who have been made holy by Jesus, uh, Jesus' death on the tree, are claimed by God to be his for eternity. We will be imprinted as belonging to God and his family. His glory will shine from his face and be imprinted upon us and we will reflect his glory. Back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, as God gave the law to Moses they were to live by that law and God instructed the Israelites to bind the law on their foreheads as a constant reminder of who they were and how they were to live. If you've ever seen a traditional Jew, you will notice that they have a box bound to their forehead. Inside that box is the Torah, the law that's written out, bound to their foreheads, quite literally. If you've been into a Jewish household, you will see that on the side of the door there is a little box that includes the Torah, the words of God in the law of him, that God said to them, bind it on your foreheads, put it on your doorpost, speak to your kids about that. But now, God's law, his love, will be etched into us. It will be coursing through us. Something until that point that we've only had the smallest glimpse of. And we will serve him. But here, the word for serve is actually the same word for worship. Serving and worshipping together. In his presence for eternity, we will eternally be glorifying God in acts of service. What is the chief purpose of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Not just serve, not just worship, but also reign over this new creation. Verse 8 says, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light. And they, us, who believe in Jesus as Lord and Saviour, will reign in this new realm forever and ever. A servant reigning. Now that is a beautiful thing. No more crying, no more sickness, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more sin, no more separation from God, but rather perfect eternity in unity of understanding, worshipping God forever. What an incredible picture Revelation 22 brings to us. Well, friends, uh, Revelation has been quite an experience being able to preach through some of that and having our guest preachers as well. 
We've learnt a lot, we've delved into a lot, we've explored a lot, we've discussed a lot, and I've really appreciated those people who've come up to me and discussed some of the points of Revelation. Gee, that's really interesting, I haven't known that before, or, oh, I thought this, I still think this, and I think you're wrong, Lachlan, I really appreciate that. I enjoy it when people come and engage, and Revelation has certainly enabled that. What have we seen throughout Revelation? A quick run-through of some key points that I think that we have noticed. Firstly... It's a letter to seven churches. John wrote this to seven churches in their persecution and suffering so that they might have hope. So for us now, when we experience suffering and pain, we have hope in an eternal future that is beyond all pain and suffering. It's just eternity with God, worshipping, serving, reigning with Him forever. We've had a glimpse into heaven. We've had a peak, if you like, through a doorway that was open to John and he's invited us into that space as well. We've seen the heavenly realms. We've seen God's history revealed, past, present and future. As each of those scrolls were unrolled, we understand that here is God's history already written, being pronounced upon his creation. As we've seen the bowls of wrath being proclaimed, we know that also God's judgment will come upon the earth. And even now we experience suffering. Of course, Revelation at its heart, if you remember nothing else, remember this, it's an exposition of the gospel of Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross. All of Revelation is about Jesus. It's all about him. That helps us to understand then the more difficult passages of Revelation. It's about Jesus. Apocalyptic metaphors and symbols mess with our minds as we look through Revelation. We see heavenly scenes that really overwhelm us. We see beasts, we see dragons, we see scrolls that are read out, we see thrones, we see incredible majesty through wonderful jewels and brilliance and so forth. But here in these apocalyptic images, God is explaining through John that heaven really is unexplainable. But here's some images that we might be able to grasp hold of to get a sense of what it's like in the heavenly realms. There are six acts through Revelation and each of those six acts has seven different scenes. So we had the seven trumpets, we had the seven scrolls, we had the seven bowls of wrath. And it's a sense that here is God's heavenly pageant that is being uh, outworked throughout us, his people, across all time. Not necessarily a systematic from beginning to end, but perhaps overlaid one heavenly scene on top of another heavenly scene. And it's all that John can do to look around and grab hold of one scene and write it down and grab hold of another scene and write it down as well. We got a sense of the overlapping realms. That is, we're existing here in our time-bound world. We exist only within the created order of time. We cannot comprehend what it's like outside of time. And yet here John has explained to us what the heavenly realms that are eternal, therefore no beginning, no end, no middle, no sense of time, overlapping our time-bound world. And as we digested what that looked like here, we struggled with what that meant to live in a timeless existence. And so sometimes we feel that jarring as we read through Revelation. Hang on, is this past, present or future? Of course, the answer is yes. Towards the end of Revelation, we see the systematic uncreation of the world. The inhabitants of the world wiped out. The realms of the world wiped out. The heavens, the air itself wiped out, leading us to the new creation that we experience in Revelation 21 and 22, where Jesus and his bride, the church, us who believe in Jesus as Lord and Saviour, are united together for eternity. Amen. There you go. I think in the end of Revelation, really what it is, is it's a call to worship. It's a call for us, God's church, to stand up and say, thank you, God. It's a call for us as his people to see that God has a plan beyond here and now. It's a call for us to say, thank you, Jesus, for making us holy. It's a call for us to stand up and to worship him. So can I ask you now, whether you might stand as I read out some verses from 2 Peter. So please stand with me 
And might this be our act of worship as we hear about what God has done. And this will lead us into a time of singing in worship as well as the band comes up shortly. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I hope that you've had the sense of God's incredible awesomeness that the veil has lifted just a small amount as we've, as we've peeked into the heavenly realms through Revelation. And here in 2 Peter 3, Peter talks about the day of the Lord that is to come. And he says this, Do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promises, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. And so, with John and with all the saints, together we say, come Lord Jesus, come. Come.